I founded Verijet to be the best airline on and for the planet, to triple the speed of short haul travel, to do that in perfect safety with reduced carbon and noise footprint. Verijet is the convergence of artificial intelligence, material science, metallurgy, that simply wouldn't have been possible five years ago. The last piece of this project went into effect January 1st of 2020. This is truly convergence technological progress. Pictured as Peter Diamandis, founder of XPRIZE, we're sitting at the Air and Space Museum. The spaceship there, 328 Kilo Foxtrot, is Spaceship One. When my daughter was two months old, I was at the launch of Spaceship One. It went up, it went up again within 10 days to show reusability and access to space. XPRIZE is something I was privileged to be a part of to help create the original XPRIZE with the intent of opening commercial space. And we put a spaceship in the Milestones of Flight Gallery in the Air and Space Museum. So off my right shoulder is the spirit of St. Louis. Charles Lindbergh flew this. Before that flight, we were barnstormers and daredevils. And after that flight, we were pilots and passengers. And everywhere he landed, they built an airport, and he created the trillion dollar transportation industry to have put a space plane in the Air and Space Museum next to the Bell X-1, the first plane to go supersonic, the X-15, the first plane to go Mach 2, the Apollo 11 capsule. It's an unbelievable experience, and when you've done that, you feel empowered to start an airline. <laughs> My, I recently, with Allison, attended the launch of Virgin Galactic in Las Cruces, and we saw Sir Richard Branson go into suborbital space on the descendant of Spaceship One. My daughter is two months old when this thing launched, and 17 years later, you can now buy a ticket to commercial space. We created an entire industry. I just don't have the words to express how powerful that is. I run in glacial time. It takes me 25 years to change an industry. You have to have a vision of where technology will be going. And to quote XPRIZE, the easiest way to predict the future is to create it. And, and I've learned to do that. I'm going to share some of that with you today. First, you need to understand the technology curves, where things are going. I had a company routing 100 million phone calls an hour, 14 billion calls a month for some of the largest telcos, software as a service basis. And I could see, you all know Moore's Law, that the cost of compute and storage was dropping. And with the adoption of cellular, we would double the transaction rate. You just had to look around to understand this. In the space between these two divergent curves, I built a 68% EBITDA company. And I had the freedom to take technology from this industry, from telecom, and apply it elsewhere. So the problem I'm cracking here is the traveling salesman problem. It's not anything you compute an answer to. It's something you tackle with brute force. If you have deep interest in this topic, Google Verage at IBM, you'll see the work we're doing in quantum computing that may actually finally crack this problem. I'm an aviator. I hold seven world speed records, and I've done a single engine transatlantic crossing. Last Saturday, we set the world efficiency record in jets and the world distance record in jets. That distance record closed course was last set in 1960 uh, in, I believe, Italy by a fighter trainer. These are historical records. I'm all into aviation. I live in an airport. This is 4,000-foot runway, 240-foot homes. We have hangars instead of you know, car garages. <laughs> and I want you to think about what it means to live in an airport. And I want you to sit with this for the next part of my presentation. So yesterday morning, I boarded this airplane. I flew over three cities in six minutes, picked up one of my investors, and brought him to Beverly, Massachusetts. That's an hour and a half drive overflying the carnage that is Interstate 95 in South Florida. <laughs> right. Tremendously safer. It used, I think it was 18 gallons. It's not terrible. Remember, this is the world efficiency record holder in jets, not yet certified. So hold that idea, what it's like to have transportation at your fingertips. NASA, does anyone know what the A stands for? It's aeronautics. NASA starts as NACA. There's no space when NASA starts. Verijet, my project, my last 
three decades is the culmination of a journey with NASA. The small aircraft transportation system. This is a NASA slide. This is about unlocking the fourth wave of high-speed travel. So we went from horses to cars and got 75 miles an hour. And we went from cars to propeller planes and achieved 200 miles an hour. And we went from propeller planes to jets, 500 miles an hour. And you know the rest. Hub and spoke, airline deregulation, TSA 911. We're back down to effective travel speeds, 75 miles an hour, door to door, even less if you're connecting. We took a miracle of technology and shackled it. There should have been a fourth wave of high-speed travel. So NASA set out to create that. The jet pictured here is the V-Jet. It's about 20 years old, funded by NASA and Williams, to demonstrate the utility of a single-engine flight deck optimized for single pilot, land at slow speeds, use any airports. What's at stake here is every time you double the speed of travel, you change out the underlying technology. It's exactly eight years from the first car to the last horse in Manhattan. That's the revolution we're talking about. Has anyone ever seen this before? This is the misery index. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, it's the hub airports. Okay. And it's always red. And you know, yesterday, American canceled 1,400 flights. It's just devastating to be flying. And why do you want to fly through these congested hubs? By the way, when you go there, they make serpentine paths to increase the display space for your shopping. They've turned transportation into a shopping experience. My personal mission is to get rid of that. And here's how you do it. In the United States, we have 5,400 airports that our planes can use. 98% of us are 20 miles from one or more of these. 300 miles an hour door to door, that's what we're talking about. This infrastructure is amazing. It's unparalleled in the world, and it's less than 1% utilized. So that's the game here. This is Ford versus Ferrari. This is Airbus versus Boeing. This is the A380, a super jumbo designed to take you to a hub of misery. <laughs> versus the 787 Dreamliner, which is carbon fiber, has better atmospherics, you feel more rested because we have higher pressures, it's got bigger windows. But more to the point, it takes you exactly close to where you want to go instead of the, the hubs. Our machine is carbon fiber. It has a lot in common with the, the 787. Part of what powers this is an AI that routinely looks at 16 quintillion routing solutions. That's a 16 with 18 zeros. And the best floating fleet operators in the US have been running this for a decade. My industry was flying 40% empty. We weren't using our machines very well. The companies on my AI are now 20% empty. It saves 800,000 metric tons of carbon every month. And that doesn't mean anything to anybody. That's enough energy to charge 98 billion cell phones. That's taking 173,000 cars off the road. And, and we're just scratching the surface. With quantum, we'll do even better. For people watching on this on video, pause it here. It's just a, a brain dump of a slide. But let me summarize it for you. One engine, one pilot carbon fiber versus two, two, and metal. Radical gains in efficiency, particularly for the short hops that we do. No metal fatigue, no corrosion. And I need to make it visceral. This is what metal fatigue is. This is a loss of life accident. It's serious. I'm not making light of this. You inflate a cabin, you deflate a cabin, the metal flexes. This is horrific. Imagine sitting there and there's no more fuselage. This beautiful airplane is the de Havilland Comet. It's Art Deco. I love it. I think it's gorgeous. It had square windows. The stress of inflating and deflating concentrated in the corners. Every three months it would blow apart with the loss of all on board. This is why Boeing and Lockheed are here in the US instead of de Havilland in the, the UK making airliners. We had round windows. I don't know if that's chance or design, but that's the impact of metal fatigue. Carbon fiber, we eliminate all of that. These are our machines. They're radically quiet. We flew two over a crowd in Pensacola at 1,000 feet. They were inaudible on the ground. They're radically efficient. They should have the world record for jet efficiency. They're fast for what they do. Mach 0.53, a little bit more than half the speed of sound, 56 gallons an hour at cruise lower environmental impact than anything else. This is the safest, best, quietest jet ever built. More importantly, though, when people fly it, they say, I've never felt as safe in an airplane. I've never been in as smooth an airplane. And I've never had such good visibility. It's that 
feedback from the passengers that change the whole travel experience. What I'm actually here to do is change the way you perceive travel, to turn it back to something joyous as opposed to the Greyhound bus ride. So this machine has won two Academy Awards for safety. They're called Collier Trophies. One of them is being awarded tonight in Reston, Virginia. That's for the ability to land the airplane. The passengers can land it at the touch of a button. You press a button, the AI takes over, lands the airplane, no pilot required. The other is for the parachute system, safe return. Pull a parachute, parachute lands the whole airplane to the ground. It works, it's already saved many lives. Fantastic technology. There's no difference in this plane between a pilot or a passenger pulling that handle. Hence the FAA gave us airline national status to fly this aircraft, single pilot, single engine. Something that's not done, been done before in a jet. This is something new in the world. The machine itself has the engine tucked behind the nacelle. At low air speeds, birds can't get into the engine. The body physically blocks it. At high air speeds, air acts as an inertial separator. So I know the miracle on the Hudson flight crew. I know you all know that story. What you probably don't know is Spirit Airlines ingested two Canadian geese about a week ago. The engine blew up. They had an emergency landing. It was on fire. This is not the airline experience you want. I want you to recast all those twin engine metal jets with big engines designed to go high and fast as giant bird vacuum cleaners. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> so, uh, I'm, I'm an airline CEO that can actually speak at climate conferences and, and, and I'm happy to throw shade as necessary. Um, the bottom strikes on this, it's active turbulence suppression. The whole time the computers are doing this, it's like roll control on a boat, so that it's radically better, safer, more convenient, all these things. It's, it's, again, something that's not been here in the world. You've been mulling over what it would be like to live in an airport. Imagine if this was a Verijet Vertiport, and on top there was a charging station, and I'll go ahead and name it the Beta Leah. We intend to be one of the passenger-carrying entities on the Beta. And imagine it's less expensive than Uber, and maybe imagine it takes $45 of electricity to charge it. And maybe imagine that its motors are more like a Tesla Model 3 and don't need maintenance. It's now cheap enough to fly to work. And I want you to think about being anywhere in your region in two hours. You know, I wake up, if it's sunny in the Bahamas, I can go to the Bahamas for a cheeseburger. If it's not, I can go to Naples and get stone crabs. I can go where it's sunny. It's like eternal spring. That's a freedom that, first of all, we never really had. But second, once you have it, there's no going back. Now think about my continent in two hours. So I called the CEO of Boom Supersonic a few years ago, and I said, my daughter was in utero on one of the last Concorde flights, and then they abandoned the Concorde, and I was saddened that we took a step back. My daughter can no longer go higher and faster, or at least as high and fast as I went. You're in the Concorde, you're at 60,000 feet, you see the curvature of the Earth, and, and we take this giant step backwards. Well, you know where this is going, very jet, boom, two hours anywhere in the continent. And then my planet, anywhere in two hours. Remember, I started with a suborbital space plane. So if Spaceship 3 had a little flatter trajectory, it would be anywhere on the planet in two hours. A 747 flying from LA to Sydney expends more energy than it would take to go into orbit. And once you're in Suborbital, there's no more air resistance. It's like free rides until you decelerate and come back down. So this is where it's going. I, I, two hours to anywhere on the planet, two hours to anywhere on your continent. Right now, two hours to anywhere in your region. That's Verijet. And fly to work. And, and I'll tell you, once you live in an airport, there's no going back. <laughs> so the last bit of this is that it's kind of pointless if we don't bring everyone along for the journey. Airline pilots have a pretty tough life. Lots of long hours, lots of different time zones, high divorce rate, it's just not a good place to be. And our pilots are out in the field and we connect them, we use VR. Remember we're a technology company masquerading as an airline. We give them a sense of community. They can see and hear each other, they hear left, right, they talk. In my industry, we're forced to retire at a calendar age. You hit 65, you're done. And I want that to be a biological age. And so these are sea changes in law and the FAA, and this is an uphill battle. But again, it takes me 10 to 25 years to do anything. That's what we're fighting. I want to restore joy and dignity to travel, not just for the passengers, but for the flight crew. 
when we show up in this intimate cabin with a happy, engaged pilot who shares their joy of aviation, it's fundamentally altering to anyone who flies with us. The last thought I'll leave you with, 80% of the world's population has never been above ground level. So for us, taking a suborbital space plane, you see the Earth from orbit, you have that overall effect. It changes your idea of country boundaries. It changes your stewardship of the Earth. Well, imagine if you've never been AGL period. That's 80% of the population. We have the ability to do that now in a non-polluting way with the next generation of EV tolls. So this is Ted and design. We have the designer of our badass paint scheme here, Allison. Please interview her about the design elements that went into the paint scheme, but also we brought a jet. I'm a terrible speaker, but we brought jets, right? <laughs> and, and so you can fly with us tomorrow. Allison will configure those demonstrations. And, and thank you for your time today.